So research the tips and techniques versus gear. So when you're out there, our, our hottest actual videos on after hours are gear stuff. We could put a great video out of like how to do awesome wildlife photography, and then you put one out of, hey, there's, look at this lens, and it'll get like thousands more hits than the one that actually learn a technique. So you want to go learn those techniques so you can use the gear better. So different examples of things you can learn. Critical focus, don't focus and recompose, crop in the camera. All those are all things that I worry about when I'm taking a shot. I look behind my shot before I even take a picture. If I was shooting you, I don't want the camera tripod growing out of your head. So I just move so it's not behind you. Not take a picture and then crop it out later or edit it out later. It's a little simple movement usually of looking at your background. Big, big thing for me and a lot of other friends that are photographers, professional speakers and photographers, shoot for personal projects. So how many people are shooting personal projects consistently? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, maybe five. So personal projects. Personal project is you go out, you do not have a client, so no one's telling you what to shoot, and you're going out and doing something just for you. So you're going to go out there and shoot something that's strictly for you and have it all interlaced with some kind of theme. So for me, this I have a few of them. I have a cemetery project, but I also have a cowboy project. So you've, if you've seen on Instagram, I have shot all of these. They're all edited very similarly. They all have the same look to them. They all have the same feel, and they all have the sepia tone that I put, and they're usually close-up shots of cowboys. So I created a style. I had a look. I just started shooting it. No one was paying me to shoot it. I just did it because I liked it, and I strung them all together. So I have thousands of these shots. Maybe there's about 50 or 100 that you have all seen, but I still haven't realized the vision in some of them that I want to still edit. So you know, this guy right here is leaning up against an easy up tent in Tombstone. He's just like leaning against it. So everything around him, there's people walking behind him. There's all kinds of stuff going on. There's buildings behind him. There's everything that, it, but again, I creatively cropped it in the camera to get all of that stuff out of like the barbecue and all that stuff that was right next to him. So you want to do these projects and do them just for you and don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Those projects are to make you better and make you consistent and be known for that. So my cemetery project, same thing. I go through and I shoot old cemeteries from like the 1700s and older and go out and just shoot them. No one's going to buy them. If they do, it's a bonus. But it's just for me. I enjoy it and it's something I keep doing and keep editing them. Someone will buy these one day when I'm dead probably. So if you start seeing these, eventually people will start noticing. So I did them on Instagram for several months where I just only posted these. So I have people that follow me now that are like Western Boots Gal and this and all these other things that people started following me because I started posting these that are people that normally wouldn't have followed me because of my other photography. So what the idea of the personal project is, it gives you an opportunity to test out new techniques. You don't have to worry about a client, a headshot or anything else. So Tom's working on a personal project now with headshots. So he went to go see Peter Hurley speak. He got inspired by it. And he said, I want to do these headshots here in Phoenix. So he's, he bought all the lights. He just bought some new lights. And he's testing these techniques out. And he could turn that into a business eventually. Take it, okay, I'm done with my personal project. Start charging for it once he perfects it. You know, I could go out and shoot you know, these guys and sell them to them for their business cards or their websites or something like that. Because everyone else taking pictures is like with iPhones. And they get these blurry pictures. Let's you challenge yourself. So you go out and you challenge yourself and see if you can get a consistent theme. Stay sharp and not get rusty. So we've all had it where we've gone out and we're like, oh, you're, you're not inspired. You kind of get rusty. You really want to go out there and shoot, but you don't know what to shoot. So if you have this project, you're kind of forcing yourself to go out and shoot and shoot and shoot and really get some work. And you begin to create a body of work. And that's a big thing. So Joel Grimes will say it all the time. He goes and does 52 personal projects a year. So he goes out every week and has a new personal project that he puts up. So he's pushing himself to get better and practice and learn and try different things and mess up. So it's definitely something that you'll see a lot of speakers talk about. Revisit your past events. So everyone's like, where's your Alaska photos? So I am not the type of photographer that goes and shoots and goes home till like two in the morning and edits them. 
I'm kind of burnt out on them as soon as I take the pictures. I want them to sit and marinate for a while. So you usually see my pictures probably two, three months from now from when I go out and do a shoot because I want to revisit it when I'm not burnt out on blurry otters. I've seen the blurry otters in person. I don't need to go revisit them till three in the morning when I get back. So I go back and revisit and re-edit my old work. And a lot of the work is terrible. So I have to re-edit it because I've over HDR'd it or whatever I did to it in that style that I really didn't like. So I'll go back and revisit it and I can identify where I've improved, where I've gotten better, recognize my patterns, what I've done wrong, in my opinion, what I've learned, figure out if I have a signature style, I want to start putting stuff together and my attention to detail and what I overlooked. So, you know, there's a lot of things like this. I would have liked to actually, I I got into this whole part where I was like, crop it in camera and I would crop everything in camera. And I have a pair of boots from my Western series like this too. And it's like, crop everything in camera, and then what you don't realize when you crop it so far in camera, now that's not there. So now if I want more of that tree, it's gone forever. So sometimes now I kind of pull out a little bit and shoot a little bit wider so then I can crop it later. So, you know, I revisit this and go, I wish I had the stem of that tree. It's kind of just missing something in the shot. So when you start to re-edit your old work, you have new eyes. So you're, you look at it and you really can see if there's something there that you missed the first time. So why to try to get it right in the camera? So I try to get it right in the camera out of the laziness. I really don't want to go home and edit. Susie loves to edit. She'll edit for hours and hours and hours on an, like one image. And to me, it's like I want to be in it and out in Lightroom really quick and have all my work done, all my settings. Not that she's not getting it right in the camera, but she does compositing. So she's out there compositing and putting a lot of different elements in there. So I'd rather be out shooting, in my opinion. I'm a photographer, not an editor. So I want to go out and keep shooting and creating content and bringing it back in. And then, um, so let's make a little pack today to say that we're never going to say, I'm going to fix that later in Photoshop. Again, I hear that way too much. They'll be like, oh, there's a telephone pole there. No worries. I'll fix that later. Why? Again, you could go like this and get rid of the stop sign. All it is is a little tilt, a little you know, creativity of not getting something in there or watching your background or whatever it may be to get it out of there. There's no need to go in and fix things that are so easy to get out in, in the first place. So that whole I'll fix it later in Photoshop shouldn't really be said. Unless you are compositing, you, as a photographer, you can probably use Lightroom almost exclusively. You don't really need to go into Photoshop unless you're doing compositing or swapping a sky out, which is compositing, or some other kind of compositing. That's built for designers. <laughs> so f- Photoshop was never built for photographers. It was built for designers and people that are doing compositing and other things like that. So unless you're compositing, you should be using Lightroom. Right, Lisa? <laughs> So, um, and Lori can vouch this, right? How much Lightroom do you use versus Photoshop? All the time. So, you don't count because you're set in your old ways. So, most of the images I'm showing you on the screen here that you've seen today have less than five minutes worth of editing in them. So, I want to get all the colors, all the tones, all the cropping as best I can, so I can just do some little tweaks, do an additional crop, straighten it out. I can never get a picture straight. No matter how hard and how many levels I have, my horizon is always crooked. The more I try, the more crooked it gets. So I have to always tweak that and fix that. So this image right here was Scott was to the left of me, Susie was to the right of me, and I was in the middle. And I think Scott was lower, and then Susie was higher, and I was in the middle, and we all got different shots. Scott has all this great ominous clouds up above because he was kind of facing up. I had a little bit of the road and then Susie has the same picture with lots of the road. So again, we're only this far apart from here to here and everyone has a different shot. Everyone had a different vision and we got it right in the camera. So, you know, you don't have to go out there and do a lot of editing to go shoot the lightning somewhere and then go back and shoot the Joshua tree and then add the cars in. That's just entirely too much work sometimes. So, Try to get it right. And you could see, I actually, about editing, it's hard to see on the screen, but I left in elements again. I I wanted to edit these little towers out. They're actually huge towers for high tension wires, but I left them in because you could see how huge the storm is compared to these, you know, how big is a high tension wire? They're hundreds of feet tall and the clouds and the lightning is just so much bigger. So they kind of dwarf them. Take your time. This girl wouldn't move out of my picture. So... (laughs) I was sitting there, sitting there, and, there, and it was worse because there were a lot more people in my picture. So this was the 
best picture I could get with no people in it. So I'm sitting there. I always go to this tree when I go down to Key West every year, and I shoot this tree. And the, the clouds are just epic this time. So I have, tree, I have this tree picture with no clouds. I have it with no water. I have it with water all the way up. I've got the tree so many different ways. But she just wouldn't get out of the shot. And there's actually people I did edit out right here. I thought I hid them behind the... I, tried, I thought I hit him behind this like stump here, but then I see like this big, big guy with a beer gut and a, and a beer that I had to edit out. So I was like, so, but there was a bunch of people playing here. And again, I don't own the beach. I can't be like, get out of my shot, kid, you know? Um, so I, I, I can't be like, get out of, get out of my shot, little kid. So these kids were playing there. They were having fun. I was getting set up and getting annoyed by bugs and stuff like that. And just hanging out here, but I was patient and waiting for them to leave. But they finally got out. The other people kind of walked behind the tree way out there. And then she was still there. And again, I kind of thought, you know, Jared Platt, I think, said this. He always leaves something in the shot that's a human element. So I was like, well, this is interesting. She's out there with a camera just standing there. I don't know why. She wasn't really taking pictures. And there was nothing past that tree to take pictures of besides the the heavy guy with the beer. So I'm not sure what she was taking pictures of, but she was just kind of standing there. So I took the shot. I figured I could edit her, edit her out later because the kids were going to all run back in and that was a lot more work to try to edit in front of this busy background than just take her out. But take your time, take the shot. I took the shot hoping that maybe she would get out and I think she eventually did get out, but I kind of like this one better. It's just, again, some of the human elements that I used to leave out, I started leaving in. So compose, control your background we talked about. Consider the time of day. This one, I don't really have a choice. Whenever I get there, it, that's when I'm going to shoot. I'm not going to sit here all day because I'm kind of in route somewhere else. Do you want random other people in your shot? If they are, I guess make them look like this because that's not a bad view. The weather, make sure that the weather is, is good, that you're not going to have a storm coming in or if you want a storm coming in. So there's lots of stuff as far as don't rush. So I, I sat there for a good hour. I don't think my dad was too happy because he was waiting for me to pick him up from the Key West airport, but I got a good shot. All right. It's easy to forget the basics. So every composition should have foreground, midground, background. Know your settings for the different situations and know which lenses to choose and what are your goals. So this story really quick is the, uh, have you, anyone, has anyone been out here? Out in Texas? Two people? So these are Cadillacs. It's Cadillac Ranch. It's out in Texas. And I was driving my, I owned a DJ and photography company in New Jersey. I was driving my DJ van back from New Jersey. This is the only thing I wanted to see. About, I don't know, a half hour before I get into town, a blizzard rolls in where like the, everything gets whited out. Cars were spinning off the road. I, one lady spun out on the, she hit the bridge and must have hit her brakes. So it was frozen, spun out. And I just saw the terror in her face and then went off the road. And you can't even do anything because if I slam my brakes on, I was either going to hit her or fall off the road too. So I get here. And this blizzard's going on. I'm like, man, I do not have the right clothes for this. I don't have gloves. I don't have, you know, so I found some cotton gloves, which really didn't help. It's crazy snowy out. It's windy out. There's no one else there. This place is usually littered with people. There's usually like 50 people here minimum. But I'm sitting there trying to shoot this picture, shaking and freezing and trying to get my settings right. And I can't even feel my fingers after a while. And it's not close to the road. They're like this big when you're further away. So you have to like walk out there on the ice. So I, I got out there and got this shot and it was just, they just popped on the white. I've never seen them on with snow or in the white. And it was so random and to have no people there, you know, so it's just, you know, you want to not forget those basics. So then when something challenging happens, like a snowstorm that you're underprepared for and not dressed for, and you still want to get the shot that you can get the settings right. And I have some different ones. You could actually, it's hard to see in here, but you can see the snow coming down. So I did some slow shutter effects to let the snow kind of blur in front of it on purpose to be able to get it where it's kind of spotted. So do you guys have goals? As an artist, try to make at least one good photo a month. You don't need 9,000. Well, Lisa does. <laughs> But out of that 9,000, what are you going for? The one shot. The one shot. So even though at that 9,000, you're going for that one shot of the Eagles, you know, locking their talons. You're not going for thousands of those shots. She's just shooting a lot to get the high frame rate to get them at the perfect spot. So you're going to put that one shot out. That's 12 amazing images per year if you just do one great shot. So going out there and posting every single image you take or like, here's my whole trip that I went to kind of dilutes your self-worth of in your brand of your branding. So if you're like, Hey, here's our 2000 shots from Monument Valley, people are going to get to like picture five and they're like, great. 
they went to Monument Valley. And all your good ones aren't going to be up front. It's just going to be like your sequence. So my sister does this. She posts like the kids will have a play date and she'll post 600 pictures from it. And they're, half of them are blurry with their eyes closed. I, and I love the kids. And it's like I get to like the 10th picture. I'm like, I can't look at it anymore. You know, so she doesn't cull through her pictures. So how do you become consistent as we start to, we start to wind down here? It's something I call, so back to planning, research everything you can. We talked about that in the earlier part, being in the right place at the right time. So this only happens twice a year where you have the shadow of one mitten on the other mitten. So being prepared as some of the moments are fleeting and it only happens one t- twice a year for a very short period of time. It, it aligns. So I have pictures of it kind of coming up to get my settings right. And then it gets in the middle and it's immediately moving and gone. So it's more of a fleeting moment. So we did take a bunch of shots to really figure out if we got the lighting and everything correct. And I was bracketing it too because I have to wait six more months for it to happen again. So I was shooting three to five shots in HDR. So I had my whole range of shots and then shooting it um, pretty rapidly to be able to catch it. And it's like, okay, it's all on there. Shoot away, shoot away. And then it was immediately, the, it started going off of the actual other monument. So perspective, your perspective is unique. And that will define your style eventually. So it may take some time. You're not always going to just wake up and be like, I know what I'm going to do, or I know what my style is. It's going to take some time to evolve. And sometimes it changes. So sometimes you're, love this style like I'm doing with the cowboy and I'm kind of taking a break from it now I got burnt out on it I'll go back to it eventually and you know but I just I'm kind of thousands of photos I can edit from it I don't have to go take more of different cowboys so it may evolve as you're going through it photography is an art of observation has little to do with the things that you see and everything to do with the way you see them so absorb that for a second and think about what your vision is of the world. How do you see it? Do you see it? Like, I love black and white. If I could shoot everything in black and white, I would. I actually turn my camera a lot of times just on the black and white mode to see the picture that way, to compose that way. How do you want to compose the shot? What settings do you want to choose to create the image? So this image of the stars being blurry, I could have shot that pinpoint stars. I could have shot that Milky Way. I could have shot them moving. I could have left it a silhouette. I could have shot it the way I did. So that was up to me of how I put the shot together and created that shot. Practice, practice, practice. So go out and keep doing it. Only way to get that consistency is to practice a lot. The main thing you want to remember is that hard work got me here and only hard work will keep me here. So that's from Humans of New York, Brandon, that said that. So he's always working to stay on top. So he got popular. He doesn't just say, okay, I'm popular. Everyone knows about humans in New York. I'm done with this and walk away from it. He keeps going out and shooting and practicing and getting better. So it's a story. I don't know what the story is. So we were, the story I think on this was that uh, we were shooting a time lapse and I caught this. So Susie and I were coming back from a workshop. We didn't have our storm triggers. So we didn't have our lightning triggers. We weren't expecting to shoot lightning. And we were just watching the storms the whole way home from, was that Joshua Tree? In Buckeye, yeah. On the way home from Joshua Tree, we were totally not prepared for this. It was daytime, so I don't normally use a lightning trigger except daytime because you can't normally get it. So at nighttime, I don't use a lightning trigger. I just do it the traditional way. So, you know, it was out there, and I knew my camera settings. I knew what I needed to do, and I put it on a time lapse. And I luckily caught one lightning bolt that was pretty cool. So, uh And we watched the storm for quite a while. We didn't just pull right over the first time. This is the best foreground I could find out in Buckeye. I do not know why all these West Coast, West, uh, West Side people keep telling me to move out to the West Side. This is this is foreground to y'all out there on the West Side. This is not foreground. This is like I don't know what that is. It's going to be a tumbleweed one day. All right, persistence will keep you on top and will help you achieve the consistency you need. If at first you don't succeed, go back as many times as you have to. So we talked about that in the patience part too. Don't give up. So this shot was shot at in a bar at Flickers. I don't know if you guys were on this. And it was basically, we just turned the front light off. So everyone else shot, 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 shot. They all got fully lit front, front shots of him front and side lit. And we just killed the front light and took the same shot. And it created something a little bit more dynamic that we thought so. And it could have been just a poor shot, but we liked it. So don't let social media get you down. 
So social media out there, there's so many good photographers now. There's tons of good photographers. And don't let those outside influences say, oh, I'm not that good. Don't compare yourself to all these other people. They're all on their own path. They're not looking at you and saying, oh, I wish I was that good. Learn from them, but don't let it get you kind of like, because again, they're not worried about you. You shouldn't be worried about them. So we're all on our own paths and you can create what you want. You have your own audience that looks at your stuff that's totally different than you know, Joel Grimes' audience or Susie's audience or, or Peter Hurley's audience. His people aren't looking at your pictures. So by Tom doing his Peter Hurley shots, he's got a whole different audience than Peter does. So he can do that and be successful in the market here where Peter's in New York and isn't worrying about you know, Tom doing those, those shots. <laughs> and be aware of internet trolls. So there's people out there that are just out there to bash you and not give you constructive criticism. Just ignore them, block them, delete them. You don't need them in your life. All right, so always look behind you. So well, that was a hard shot to see on the screen. It's really dark down here. So always look behind you. Sometimes that epic shot is there. So I was shooting um, a little church little chapel with the superstitions behind. And I was trying really hard to get lightning. And that was my foreground. And I planned it all out. And uh, Ken Sklut was on the other side of the mountain with another friend. And they were shooting. They were getting awesome shots. And I was just getting nothing. And the storm kind of just came around. And it didn't do anything awesome. But then all of a sudden, I had another two cameras going. When I shoot my storms, I shoot wide angle and close up. because, Or I'll shoot two different directions, depending how wide it is. And all of a sudden I turned around and the whole sky is turning pink and purple and other stuff is happening behind me. So you, you want to look behind you because sometimes, especially with sunsets, it'll look better behind you. And I happened to catch that little lightning in there, which was just even better. Now I am in the middle of the road in Apache Junction, so I wasn't too happy about my foreground, but it was still, you know, it's, it kind of proves the point of, you know, always look behind you. I wish the little church was here. That would have been even better, but um, and, a, and a quote from Joe McNally, don't pack up your camera and your gear before you've left the location. So too many times you put everything away and then something like this happens and you're struggling to get everything out. I'll leave my tripod unlocked and open, just throw it in the back of my car so I can pull it out and just put it down if I need to when I'm doing lightning and stuff. So what is luck or serendipity as they say? So a big element of all of this is luck. So you have to be in the right place at the right time. So it's the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way. This is way better than the first, first definition I gave you, which is you have to go through pain and grueling and everything. So happy and beneficial way. So there's a huge, huge component of being lucky to get the shot, and especially in wildlife photography. So happy accident, fluke, there's all these other things. So you have to be in the right place at the right time. And again, don't get down that you keep going out there and shooting and shooting and shooting and not getting the shot. It's really hard on road trips too because you're just passing through sometimes and you may have to go back there and shoot it again. You know, we've been up to Antelope Canyon and Horseshoe Bend 15 times, if not more, and every time we get different shots. Sometimes they suck. Sometimes they're great. You know, you never know. So luck is, hap luck is what happens when skill and preparation meet, and you're ready. So you know your camera, you know your, everything is ready, and you're ready to go. So you can create your own luck out there then. So when you're ready and everything happens, and you have your camera settings right for that particular situation, so you do all that research we talked about, you research the location, you learn your camera, and all of that comes together. So this shot, you've all seen this shot probably if you've known me at all. We've had it printed here, we've had it in the auctions. I was just sitting there in the rain, and my friend Clint, Ken Sklut was sleeping because he didn't want to wake up. I slapped on his tent and I was like, hey, do you want to go shoot the sunrise? Which I never shoot sunrises. Something made me wake up to go shoot the sunrise. And I, I, they said, no, it's raining, right? I said, yeah, it's raining. You're in a tent. You can hear it. So he's like, no, we're going to just sleep in. So I drove across and sat in the rain just getting soaked with my cameras going. So if you look at my sequence of shots of this, and I've showed Susie this so she can vouch for it. It's like gray, 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 gray. This for about 28 seconds or something, I can look at it, and then gray, 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 gray. So I had two cameras going, one wider. So one was the first mitten, second mitten, and then there's that other butte over here to the side, I think, a Merrick butte. And then this one was the tighter shot close in. So if I didn't know every, again, I was, I was out there just like, what am I doing out here? I'm sitting there going, why am I here? What am I doing here? I should be sleeping like these other guys. And this just happened. If I would have slept through it, and wasn't able to capture it 
and it wasn't in the right place at the right time, I would have just slept through and never know it happened. So I was sitting there and I was actually walking back to the car to go get something and my cameras were still in place and I saw a glow on the front of the car and I was like, what is that? And I turned around and I saw the start that happened. So what happened here was the sun came up right here and it skirted through the two mittens. They're not, they're not in line. So it skirted through and all this orange here is the rain coming down that was getting me wet the whole time. So the rain coming down lit up, the whole sky lit up up to the top. So in the wider view, you can see the blue up top here, which Susie likes that one. I'm not, not a big fan. So you can see the blue way up here. And then it just lit up and this all silhouetted out. And I do have it bracketed. So I tried to do it the way I did the one that I first started with and I didn't like it. it there was too much distraction. So I, I ran it as a silhouette. So that's why this one's silhouetted out because the light's actually coming through there. So there's no rules for good photographs. There are only good photographs, Ansel Adams. So I'll leave you with this last quote as we round up. So maybe because it's entirely an artist's eye, patience, and skill that makes an image, not his tools, by Ken Rockwell. So this is Luis Menendez, the picture I took here of him. And it's shot outside of B&H, and he's pretty famous. He goes and shoots these big format cameras actually out all over New York and takes pictures and he works it and he makes thousands and thousands of dollars doing this because he charges, I think, 20 or $40 a picture. And people pay him to take pictures. Of he moves around. So he works it with this old gear and he works for the whole New York City area. So when the tree is up, he's down by Rockefeller Center and he's taking pictures and selling them to people for 20, 30 bucks a pop or whatever it is. I forgot. I looked it all up. I forgot right now. But he's out there making money with this gear, which we would all look at and be like, wow, it's old gear. But he's still using the gear he has. And it sets him apart from the 3,000 people next to him at the Rockefeller tree that have the same camera DSLRs. So people pay him, not the person next to him. Okay, back on your patience one. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I did on, uh, or I should have done better on uh, the trip I just went on, was to review what I was doing along the trip. Along the trip. And because uh, what I'm finding now is I'm uh, actually e am editing some of my 9,000 pictures or whatever. <laughs> um, it's never a good thing, right? 9,000 pictures. never a good thing. Now. But anyway, I'm looking at it and it says, boy, I wish I had you know, seen that at the time and I could have fixed it. To fix it, yeah. So in the studio, I prevent that by tethering. So I actually tether to that TV. This stand goes on that bottom bracket there and I tether in. So in people photos, I can see it 42 inches or at least on my laptop, so I can check critical focus and all of that stuff. In the field, it's a little bit more difficult to tether. You can tether. There are programs like CamRanger, if you have a Canon or Nikon, that you can put the CamRanger on top. I have a brochure out there for it, and then it'll tether at least to your iPad, so you can see it on your iPad and zoom in there. So that helps with that, so you can make sure that your focus is correct, that your cropping is correct, that your depth of field is correct, stuff like that. So definitely, definitely a good point is kind of check your stuff, especially if you're shooting blurry otters. So, Other questions? I was curious about how you approach the people. Um, do you get the permission? Are you just taking it from a distance? Okay. Um, so the question is um, for the cowboy project that I was doing is how – uh, do I get permission for people or do I just take the shots? So a lot of those cowboy shots were shot uh, from a distance, like kind of like street photography. So with my, my Canon 70 to 200, and I would just shoot them from further away and zoom in. Some of them I did ask for permission. So if it was kind of a more intimate situation or that it would be creepy if I was like shooting them, um, then I would go talk to them and say, hey, do you mind if I take some shots of you? But most of the time, I'm not really that kind of photographer. I don't, I don't, I always feel weird. Like, Hey, can I take some pictures of you? So I know people are really comfortable with that. That works well, but I was trying to catch candid moments. So a lot of the times the one with the guy smoking the cigarette, that one, I did ask him most of the other ones. I just kind of shoot them and catch those moments. So I did event photography for a long, long time. And so I was very good at catching moments in event photography so I kind of used to that kind of snipering shots and, and getting them from across the street and stuff. So then do you just take them for your own enjoyment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is if they want it. Oh, so it's fine art. So are you talking about copyright? Are you talking about like copyrights or if I need to sell it or something? Good point. So 
if I if I need to sell up, it's if it's sold as fine art, I don't have to worry about it. So if I sell it as fine art, if I sell it as commercial, then I have to worry about it. At the end, you could definitely talk to Scott over there. That's um, he works with ASMP, and he could definitely go over some of that stuff as far as what's uh, usage terms. But fine art is totally different from commercial. So if I'm shooting for absolute vodka and they put me in an assignment. You have to get permission. You have to get the rights. You have to get all of that stuff and get all the different releases. Um, but for fine art, you don't have to worry about that. Other questions? Just a quick humorous comment that all those blurry otters and eagles with your patience and consistency turned into sharp blurry, sharp eagles and otters instead by the end of the week. So. By the end of the week, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So again, patience, consistency, practicing, asking, asking other people that know more than me about what settings we were using and everything. So you definitely want to, you know, learn from other people too. I learned a lot that week about blurry otters and eagles. So, uh, and we had laughs and fun too. And, and Lori knows every bird's name now, backwards and forwards. Mine was more of an observation. Um, Cadillac Ranch mm -hmm. used to be closer to the road. Oh, really? The cars haven't moved. The road did. The road moved? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Route 66 used to go right by it. Was a lot. So Cadillac Ranch was like right it there. It's not have, close, especially when it's a blizzard. That really was have, not fun. Didn't have graffiti. <laughs> when, when, you know, back when I saw that. <laughs> it, was, it was so windy and cold. Yeah, it was. And, yeah, and the, I wondered why they would put it so far away from the so road. So far away. Like, why? <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah that storm. The the funny part, the other funny part about that story is, I was gonna take. I always take the southern route, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna take the northern route, and I'm like, ah, it might snow, so I'm gonna go the southern route. There was no snow in the northern route at all, so like I went that way, and I got stuck in was it Tukutukamare? Yeah. So I get stuck there. They just closed the highway. They're just like, yeah, 40 or whatever it is is closed. You have to stay here. And I was almost home. I was like, ah, I just, I was almost out of that state. And nope. I just yes. want to make sure that I heard you right. Uh, for the fine art shot, you don't need model releases. For a fine art shot, you don't, right? You don't need any model releases. If you're just going to print it and sell it on Fine Art America or any of that, you don't need anything. Not true. Not true? Time that you sell anything, you do need a release because if that particular person you took that picture of sees that someone bought that, they can actually come back and get you or sue you for that. So, so you do need a release. It's not that hard to do. I have a little app on my, app, on, my yeah. on my cell phone. Yeah, it's like you know, would you mind doing that? You know, and if it's you think it's a great shot, pay somebody twenty bucks. You know, five bucks, ten bucks, anything. It's yeah. It's always better to get a release, but with street photography, it's almost impossible to get releases a lot of times. Street photography, as long as you use it for editorial, you're pretty good. Not not a problem. Yeah. But you've always got that one person who says no. You know. That's not, yeah. That they don't know, want it, to. Yeah. It is what it is. You know, it's one of those things. How. It's a it's a rocky slope right now because I've heard it both ways. Ruth Ruth, who is the lawyer for copyrights, yeah. that's come and spoke for us. She's she's kind of said you know that it could go either way. That the fine art stuff is pretty much if you sell it, that someone puts on their exactly. wall in their house, that's different than you selling it to yes. like again, you know, a car company or something. Yeah, it, it's it's just a you know what are you comfortable with? Yeah, if you're just going to do it for yourself and stuff like that, I wouldn't worry about it. But if somebody asked you to buy it for something, it's I, better to have it. Yeah, have your you know. So with stock photography, you definitely need it. They won't even accept the pictures yeah. anymore if uh, if you don't have a model release yeah. and a property release sometimes. And at least they want to cover themselves. So I do have some people that I know that um, posted their family pictures up on Facebook. And they went up to Europe two years later. And they're walking down the streets where they have all the stores and shops. And they're going, wow, that family looks just like ours. <laughs> and they did billboards of them because... They actually, when you post anything on Facebook, if you read the fine print, they can use those for anything. Yeah. And and they did. And they had no no. When it starts getting into other countries, yeah, it's yeah. even even more difficult. It's, it's an interesting concept, the world we live in now, run by lawyers. <laughs> other questions before we wrap it up? And I'll be up here for questions after as well, but is there any other questions before? We? All right, so I will show you real quick before we wrap it up. So I switched from my Canon to this is what I shoot now. So from a full bag 
of gear to that. And I could put it in my pocket almost. If I had a Merce, I could put in a Merce. So, you know, I could pass around as long as you guys don't drop it if you want to look at it and stuff and, and see. So, again, a lot of being patient and consistent and everything is not wearing yourself out and being exhausted when you get somewhere. So we were exhausted by the time we got up to arch to the arch up there, a delicate arch. I could have taken a nap. I was so beat carrying all this gear and everything. So, you know, by lightening your load, it's also very helpful to, uh, you know, to being more passionate and getting a good shot. So, so thank you guys and girls for coming.